Shall we start? Uh oh, here we have someone else. Uh, I usually don't require a microphone. Um, I am going to turn this one up a little bit, maybe. Can you hear me okay? You can hear me fine, of course. Uh, but I want to really echo and rumble whenever, you know, whenever I'm talking. If you've come here today to receive a treatise in dark matter, string theory, or quantum mechanics, you've come to the wrong place. <laughs> because I'm, you're not going to get that from me. Uh, but what you will get from me today is a pep talk about space exploration. And we got some more, I think, coming in here, so I'll wait on them too. They don't get that beautiful introduction again. <laughs> okay, not a problem. Not a problem. But do let me introduce myself. My name is Earl Mullins. I am the founder and president of the Space Museum in Bonterra, Missouri. Most of you are familiar with it by now, I would think. Uh, I hope to make you a little more familiar with it today and the opportunities that it presents to this area. And as I previously said, if you're here for a uh, astro physics seminar or treatise, you've come to the wrong place. But what you will get from me is a pep talk on space exploration and why it's so important and why we need to engage in it and why maybe that it has gone on the back burner today, which is really, 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 really unfortunate. Uh, matter of fact, I am so passionate about it, I would ask you to do this for me. Whenever I get an opportunity to get on the soapbox, it's hard to get me knocked off, so if I start going <laughs> long, just do this, okay? I, I won't mind, trust me, I've been shut down by the rich and famous, all right? Uh, but the museum is a very special place, and I am very passionate about it. So passionate, as a matter of fact, that Charlie Walker, any of you know who Charlie Walker is? Charlie Walker worked for McDonnell Douglas, and he was the first industrial astronaut. He did not work for NASA. He was a uh, McDonnell Douglas employee, and during his three missions, he flew three times in 15 months, which is totally unheard of, but in those 15 months he did research on the space shuttle to develop highly refined drugs in space. Charlie's a very close friend of mine and he has dubbed me with a new moniker, okay? And I own it. He calls me the reverend of what's happening up there. <laughs> and that's okay, I don't mind because I do get a little bit preachy because I am very, very passionate about it, and I, I do believe in what we're doing at the Space Museum. But to give you a little bit of history, some of you may know this, some of you don't know this, uh, but I started as a sole proprietorship in 2003. It became obvious very, very soon. By the way, do all of you know where the museum is at, right? The little building next to Heritage Hall in Bonterre. Uh, we're currently working on the annex, and hopefully, again, that will be open this summer. But at any rate, we... Uh, began as a sole proprietorship in 2003, and it was based around my collection of many, many years. I was in, I think, the first class to graduate from this campus. Yeah, so this is my alma mater. Unfortunately, I have to admit this, I didn't extend my education. So an associate's in engineering technology is all that I have. Since that time, there have been very intelligent people, and I'm just bragging on myself here, that, says, that say now I have a doctorate in aerospace history. And that may be true. The only reason I mention that is this, and I wish we had had some younger people here today, but do we have teachers in our audience? No? But you have influence over younger people. Encourage them to extend their education as far as they can go. Now, I will say this, though, about education. Education doesn't make you someone. It gives you the tools to become someone, right? And I am grateful that I have been given the opportunity, even at my limited level of education, to actually become someone. And I don't say that 
in a narcissistic way. I say that because that is the opportunity that we're given here in this country. Just because you don't complete your education, just because perhaps the dice didn't roll in your favor on certain occasions does not prohibit you from doing what you want in this country. We live in still, I still believe, and I get preachy about this too, we still believe, I believe that we live in the best country in the world. Okay? I would, no applause? <laughs> oh my goodness, I am, I'm hurting here. Okay, so we, 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 were, we were formed in 2003, and since that time we, we have continued to grow. In 2008, we reorganized as a not-for-profit. It became evident very, very soon that in order to be able to do what we wanted to do at the museum, we had to have governmental connections. Being a not-for-profit puts us in line for uh, donations uh, to receive NASA memorabilia, etc. It opens some doors for us that we didn't have as a sole proprietorship. So we chose to reorganize as a not-for-profit in 2008. We did that. We see the museum as a model of what the space program is all about. I love the technology because that's my bent. I, mean, I have an engineering bent, and I love that, and I love the technology, but there is more to the museum than just the technology. I say that the museum is more about a way of thinking than it is about the technology. In 1961, we were challenged by a young president, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, to take this nation to the moon. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. We didn't know how to do it. We didn't know how to get there. And frankly, we didn't even have the materials or the machinery to do it. Yet in nine short years, on July 20th, 1969, who was the first man to set foot on the moon? Let's see who is paying attention. I didn't tell you though, did I? Who was the first man? Come on, Neil Armstrong. First man to set foot on the moon. What does that mean to us? It means that we overcame numerous obstacles to get there. And frankly, the museum in Bonterre has overcome numerous obstacles to be what it is today. Over the last few years, we have literally reached out to thousands of kids and adults. And frankly, if you've never been involved in one of our educational programs, if you ever have an opportunity to do that, I do a program called Rockets Rule. And we blow things up, make smoke, make fire. Obviously, the kids love it, right? But it does have a large impact on those that we perform it for. And if you ever have the opportunity, sit in on one of those. But we have hopefully impressed and influenced kids over the years. Our collection continues to grow. Originally, the museum was based around my collection of many years. Unfortunately, I was not able to be able to follow my passion in aerospace. After I graduated here, I was neither smart enough or probably motivated enough at that particular time to go ahead and try to actually pursue a career in aerospace. So I went a different direction. I went into mechanical engineering and in industrial work, and that's worked out very, very uh, well for me. But since that time, we have continued to grow at the museum, and as a result, we are adding, we are adding over are you ready for this? This is really cool. Since we organized as a not-for-profit, we are adding $20 million worth of assets from NASA. Yes, you heard that right. Now, you could take most of that and stick it in that corner. But let me finish my thought. The point is this. You can take your circumstances, as I did, as a... Uh, to your college graduate and turn those around and actually do something of value for the community. Right? Would you agree with that? Because it's really true. We have overcome many, many obstacles. Funding is one of them. Whenever we decided to start a museum, I have another very close friend, and I'm not a name dropper. I just want you to understand we have connections in the aerospace community. This is not a flyby. This is not a uh, roadside wonder. We're very, very serious about what we're doing over there. 
uh, my very close friend, Lowell Grissom, who is the brother of Gus Grissom, our second American astronaut, whenever I was talking to him about starting this museum, he told me there's no money in it. And he's absolutely right. <laughs> That's why they call it a not-for-profit, right? But since that time, we have been able to thrive and survive on the uh, donations and volunteer efforts of many. I've talked about our annex a little bit, and I don't want to bore you with this, but it's very, very exciting. We call them the three amigos. We have three gentlemen who actually worked at McDonnell Douglas and designed and built our first spacecraft, Mercury, our second spacecraft, Gemini, worked on the shuttle program, worked on Skylab. The youngest of these three guys is 86. They have been with us nearly every weekend for the last two and a half years to put this together. I think that's incredible. But it's the same kind of spirit that they exhibit now that took us to the moon in the 1960s. The same spirit. And that's the spirit that we want to foster and that we want to influence people with at the museum. Over the years, I have developed, and I told you I didn't go into my aerospace uh, career because I was neither smart enough, although I did, got to brag on this too, I graduated in the top 10% here. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, you know, I, I was neither smart enough are inclined enough to follow my aerospace career, but I have adopted a credo that I live by over the years. And here it is, three points. Number one, and if you don't remember anything else from this talk today, remember this, okay? Number one, the answer is always no if you don't ask. I am unashamed. I will talk to anyone I will ask anything, anytime, anywhere. Now, I try to be a little bit couth, okay? But I don't miss an opportunity. And by the way, if you don't realize it, I'm beginning to put the pressure on you right now. I, I never miss an opportunity to ask anybody for anything. And believe me, it has opened doors. Open doors. Many, many doors. So much so, I was looking through these books while ago. I just came back from a symposium in Indiana uh, know this guy, uh, astronaut Curtis L. Brown, flew on the shuttle back in the in the 80s. Anyway, just thought I'd throw that in again, not to be a name dropper, but because that's the kind of things we're doing. So first of all, never be afraid to ask anything. You're just as important as anybody else. Neil deGrasse Tyson puts his genes on just the way I do. Now, granted, he has a cerebrum about this big around, right? <laughs> But it doesn't make any difference. I am finding out that, honestly, most people in the aerospace business that are, and that are involved in the things that we do are really grassroots people anyhow. And frankly, most of them don't like groupies. But if you go in there and you ask the right questions and they know you're sincere, the world opens up. Absolutely, the world opens up. So that's number one that I live by, okay? Number two, and I know you're going to find this hard to believe. I don't mind getting older as long as I don't have to grow up. I don't mind. Always, 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 always retain this if you don't retain anything else. Retain your inquisitive attitude, your sense for wonder, and the excitement that comes from all of it. Be a kid. Don't let the years beat you out of those things that you can have if you just kind of put your pride aside occasionally, okay? So that's number two. And number three, when I die, I want to fission, not fizzle. Dr. Psalm will appreciate that. <laughs> not every nuclear pile that's put together fission. But I want to fission. I want to be, I want to leave this world kicking and screaming. I don't want to give up. I don't want to roll over. As long as there's life in me, I'll be probably working on a space museum. And I'm here to tell you one thing that I do regret is that I have not worked with the college more than I have. I'm giving my, my handlers about seven more months. 
and then I'm slipping my chains and I'm going to devote full time to this. So you may be seeing more of me, so I'm warning you in advance. Okay? All right. So now, all that introduction to say, and I really don't have a whole lot more time here, but I, I hope you get the impression of where I'm headed with this. I said that this talk was going to be our, about our destiny in space. Now, destiny is a good word. What is it? You know what the definition of destiny is? I looked at several different so, uh, sources. I looked at Webster's. I looked on Wikipedia. Uh, but, and so I compiled a consensus of all those definitions of destiny. But you know what destiny is? Come on. Raise your hand. Be a kid. Don't be shy. What is it? It's the end of the journey where you're supposed to be. Where you are where you're supposed to be. Where you're supposed to be. That's exactly right. It's not a guess. It is a predetermined and certain future. So we have to ask ourselves, do we have a predetermined and certain future in space? You know what that depends on mostly? You guys. A whole lot of that depends on you. Now, there aren't necessarily any youngsters in the room, but hold, hopefully every one of you are students. Because I don't know about you, I never get too old to learn. Learning every day. Every day. The only thing I haven't learned is to shut up. <laughs> Learn every day. So I speak to you as students. You make your own destiny. You have a choice in that. You decide what that destiny is going to be. Pick a good one. I am convinced that we do have a destiny in space. I think it is absolutely inevitable that we continue to explore space. I think it is inevitable that we are going to live in space. And there are several reasons, and I will go through those just really, really quick uh, here in a minute. But I think, how many of you would like to travel in space? Yes! That's why we're here, right? I, I spoke at the uh, International Space Development Conference in St. Louis. You know, everybody was up there giving their papers and all this stuff. And <laughs> I want to fly in space. I know why they were there. They want to fly there. Well, right now the cost is about $10,000 a pound. It would cost me $2.5 million to be launched into space. You do the math. Okay. So it's a very expensive proposition, but I truly believe, I truly believe with the things that are occurring now, we might get our shot. Some of you, you might make it. I don't see a whole lot of gray hair in your head. You got, you got no hair to have gray. So we might make it. I really believe that we've got a shot at this, and it's very, very important that we, that we take advantage of it. But we've got problems. We've got challenges. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I spoke to you about that a while ago. Whenever we decided to go to the moon, we had no clue. You know how many, how much time we had in space whenever Kennedy spoke over the podium and challenged us to go to the moon? You, you know how much time we had? 15 minutes! Alan Shepard took a short suborbital hop from the, from the Cape out into the Atlantic Ocean. 15 minutes. And either this president was crazy or gutsy. One, I want to believe he was gutsy and forward thinking. He challenged us to go to the moon. Over, uh, give or take, correct me, I know you know the exact number, depending on whether it's Paraloon or Apolloon. Okay, 200, about 250,000 miles. Took us three days to get to the moon. Two days to get back. That's a physics question. I won't go into that now. All right. So we went to the moon. We challenged ourselves to go to that. Now we're looking at Mars. Closest approach. How long do you think it's going to take us to get to Mars? Anybody got a guess? Well, I'll give you a little bit of a hint. It takes 14 minutes for a radio signal to go round trip traveling at the speed of light. That's 186,000 miles a second. Don't you correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> 186,000 miles. 
It's going to take us anywhere between six and eight months to get there. Okay? I tell the kids that I talk to, when you're going to Mars, you better like the people you're traveling with. <laughs> right? Once we get there, we've got to live there a year and two months before the planets line up so we can come home. Then it's eight months home. Can we do that? Yes, we can do that! And that's what I want you to believe whenever you leave here. We can do that. Yes, we can. There's a lot of people scratching their head and wanting to know why we want to do that. And I'm going to tell you why here in just a minute. Okay? All right. So anyway, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of risks. Let's just talk about some of the problems. But problems aren't a bad thing. Problems produce solutions, right? And solutions mean something. Problems, weightlessness. Now it's fun for a while, but for every day you spend in a weightless or microgravity situation, it takes your body one day to recover when you return to Earth. These guys on these long duration missions, uh, uh, it takes a long time for them to recover. Why? Because our bodies are very adaptive. When we're in a weightless environment, our body decides, hey, I don't need to support this 250 pound structure anymore. I don't need the bone. Quits making bone. Your eyes go, right now they're elliptical, they go round in space because of the equal tension over the membrane. So some of the astronauts have suffered eye problems. Okay? There are other situations I won't go into, but weightlessness really causes a problem. We're going to have to overcome that. Now everybody gets this picture of the spaceship, the wheel, the space station, right? Well, that's not as simple as it looks because everything has to be balanced. If it's spinning, you're developing artificial gravity. It's a whole other story. It's not, it's not that easy. But we're going to have to overcome weightlessness. Radiation is a big one. Right now, we are shielded by the atmosphere around us from radiation, but yet the radiation is still strong enough. You go outside on a hot day like this and stand in the sun without sunscreen, what's going to happen to you? You don't get cooked. Okay? But that's just a tiny bit of the radiation that actually exists out in space. There, there's, there's, I mean, it's alpha, uh, alpha and, and gamma, gamma rays, you name it. It's a, it's, a, it's a witch's brew of radiation. Very, very dangerous. So much so that when we go to Mars, we're going to have to have safe places to live in the spaceship to protect us from that radiation. One thought is to put our water supply around the spaceship to help protect us from the radiation. We're going to solve that problem. One great scientist even suggested, now that we are really delving into uh, the realm of genetic engineering, his suggestion was, Dr. Psalm's probably heard of this, his suggestion was to mix cockroach DNA with human DNA. Why? Cockroaches are literally impervious to radiation. I won't go into the ethics for that. <laughs> Don't think I want to be any part of that. But the point being is, people are considering ways to solve these problems. Consumables. You can't take all your food with you. You're going to have to grow your food. We're going to have to have farmers when we go to Mars. Hydroponics. All sort, There's even people who are growing vegetables and plants and food in thin air. It's amazing. They're working on this now. Our consumables. Water. And I always get the kids whenever I talk to them about this. I tell them that on the International Space Station, water's heavy. costs a lot of money to get it in space. On the International Space Station, they have to reprocess that. So guess what? <laughs> You're drinking your buddy's pee pee. And they get all bent out of shape and everything. I said, well, wait a minute. What do you think the Earth is but one big spaceship? Every drop of water that was here on this earth is still here. When you take, just think of this, next time you get a nice cold glass of water, you may be drinking some of Beethoven's, Beethoven or Adolf Hitler's pee pee. Same thing works. It's a solar still. I mean, 
You know, we, we think the water, the water it's, it's a remarkable thing. It's purified, falls back as rain. We drink it, it goes back into the atmosphere again. So it's not such an inconceivable thing that we would reprocess this water. Consumables. Distance. I talked about distance. Amazing. What was it? Nine months to Pluto. Nine months. Voyagers, the two voyagers that were launched in the 70s, have just left our solar system. So we're stuck at home in our own neighborhood for a while. We, the distances are vast. So unless somebody comes up with a way to warp space, bend time, and actually they're, they're figuring out, I just saw on MSN, help me on this, my memory isn't completely clear, uh, clear on this, but, but they uh, just uh, beamed a particle to a spaceship out in space uh, in junk time. Now one particle, and it took several to do it, but hey, 10 years ago we didn't know how to do that. So maybe at some point, it's going to be, beam me up, Scotty. You never know. So people are out there working on all these problems, okay? We got all these problems, and I asked this question a while ago. So why in the world do we want to do this in the first place? Kind of makes you scratch your head, don't it? it Cost millions upon gazillions of dollars to do it. We face all of these dangers and hazards out there to do it. Any idea? You got an idea why we want to do this? I think we need to look for more livable space. Wow. You're hired. <laughs> that is one of them. We're running out of room, folks. We're running out of room. Okay? Nature says this. If a species overpopulates and outgrows its home, what's going to happen? Die off. Die off. We're going to die. Okay? Not, not a happy thought, but it's going to happen. If we, if we continue to grow at the rate we're growing, and I don't believe in euthanasia, and I don't want to get into the politics of abortion, but I don't believe in that either, we're going to have to have room to live somewhere. Somewhere we're going to have to have room to live. And it may not be here. We, most people think it's Mars. That's the closest planet to us. Uh, but we've got challenges there too because on a very balmy day, the highest temperature that you're ever going to find on Mars at noontime, about 18 inches off the surface of the Mars of Mars is 59 degrees. Most of the time, the Martian atmosphere runs an average of 64 degrees below zero. Okay? And there's very little water, very little atmosphere, but we're finding out that we got ways to overcome that. So why in the world do we want to go through all of this trouble? But you're right, that's one of them. Space, we gotta have space. Somebody else hazard a guess. We usually explorers just go there because it's there. <laughs> Bingo, I love you, Dr. Psalm! That's the one that I believe in more than anything else. But you know what, you can't justify that in dollars and cents. We human beings are hardwired to explore. We have to do it. It's our nature. And if we don't do it, guess what happens to us? We stagnate and we die. If there is nothing to push us forward, we're sliding backward. We are not in stasis. Human beings are not static creatures. You're either moving forward or you're moving backward. One or the other. I don't know about you, but I'd rather move forward. And the only thing that's going to move us forward are the challenges, right? The challenges. And if we, if we accept those challenges and we do something to, to defeat those challenges, we're all bettered for it, right? So that's number two. Well, I got another one. Anybody else? Hazard a guess. Mac basketball. Come on. Please. Somebody else in the orange shirt. Resources. Get yes, yes, we're running out of resources. Absolutely. It has, been, it has been known for a long time, again, I'm not a physicist, I just read this in the books, that the moon is a great source for helium-3. And helium-3 
has the potential of providing us with all the material we need for fusion reactors. Fusion, if we can ever master fusion, our energy problems are essentially solved. But there's even more practical solutions that we find in space. Okay? There was, there's been numerous studies done on this, and I'm just going to give you the simplistic Earl Mullins version. But if you were to, if you, there is enough energy falls on one square meter in space per hour to illuminate ten and a half 100 watt light bulbs. So if you take and you build an array out in space that is one kilometer square, you can literally harvest enough energy from the sun, which by the way is going to be around for a while, you can provide all the energy that a city the size of Los Angeles needs. Period. No smoke, no fossil fuels, no atomic stuff, no danger there, free energy. Now, obviously, it costs money to put that infrastructure in place, but that's not a bad thing because the people that works on that infrastructure, guess what? They make a wage. They get paid to do that, then they pay that money into taxes, and the taxes go back to support the program. Not such a bad deal, right? Self-perpetuating. So there are things right now that we could do in space to help solve our energy situation. So we've got three knocked down. Somebody else? There's a couple more that are very, very important. And I'm going to flip over here to my notes so I know what they are. <laughs> okay? How about, and this affects us all, how about economic? I am a firm believer, if you were to put, if our country would quit all this quibbling about stuff that don't amount to nothing and put us on a fast track to Mars, you would see our economy grow as you have never seen it grow before. And why do I say that? Because we have a pattern for that. During the Apollo program in the 1960s, there were absolutely hundreds of thousands of people that worked for the Apollo program or on the Apollo program. And our economy improved. It improved greatly. Whenever it was over in 1972 and the funding was cut, our country actually went into a bit of a recession because of that. So it generates money. I tell people it is a proven fact, this is a proven study, and I forget exactly where it came from, for every seven dollars that is spent for space exploration, or I'm sorry, I got that backward, for every one dollar spent on space exploration and the study and the technology of it, we get seven dollars worth of benefit. Okay, it comes back to us in the way of earnings. You know, this stuff isn't just, doesn't magically appear. It's built by tradesmen and, and it's designed by scientists and engineers. They all make a wage. Again, it goes into the economy, goes into the pool, and then it comes back in the way of taxes, right? But then there's even a better thing than that. I hope I'm not boring you. I'm starting to lose my audience. Okay. Um, spinoffs. How many of you know what a spinoff is? How many of you got one of these? Thanks, space exploration. Any of you got contact lenses? Thanks, space exploration. Any of you had an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging? That started out, they used that to check the wells on the spacecraft. Now they check your wells. Okay? Super insulations. Our, my refrigerator, I know some of you might remember this. When I was a kid, our refrigerator insulation was that thick and didn't do a great job. Now it's that thick. Super insulation, right? Composite materials, climate control, weather prediction, you name it, the list is endless. We all benefit from this. So it's economic. Sociological, that's another one. Had anything wonderful you could really believe in lately? I'm going to give you one example of what a joint effort, and I believe in an international effort. I don't have a problem with that, although I believe that America is the greatest country in the world, and I personally think we ought to lead the pack. There's always going to be, I don't care, folks, I, I, 
we cannot level the playing field. We can't. There's always going to be a winner. There's always going to be a loser. I don't care how you slice it. There's always going to be somebody that's number one, and there's always going to be somebody that's number two. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather our country be number one. Okay? For any number of reasons. If we eliminate competition, in effect, what we have done is eliminated encouragement to strive to improve. If there's no competition, there's no inducement to do better, right? It's always been competition. It's what took us to the moon. We weren't going to let those pesky Russians beat us to the moon. We went to the moon first. Anyway, competition, sociological effects. But we need something as a country and as a species to believe in. I'll give you one example. In uh, uh, Christmas 1968, we circled the moon for the first time, Apollo 8. These guys, whenever they came back home and on our journey home, they received thousands and thousands of telegrams and well, wish, uh, well wishes for the feat that they had pulled off. But there was one, there was one that meant the most to them and means the most to me. Think back to 1968 if you're old enough. Martin Luther King was killed. Bobby Kennedy was killed. The Watts riots were going on. Vietnam was escalating. It was a mess. An absolute mess. They got one telegram that said this. And this is all it said. You saved 1968. When we have something to believe in, our society changes, doesn't it? We get our minds off ourselves. Poor bit of me. And we have something that we can believe in and unite over. And I can't think of anything better than this, okay? But then there's one last one here. Am I boring you all? You may leave if you wish. One last one. Probably the most important. Any of you ever heard of a lady by the name of Ellie? She's not a very nice lady. Ellie. Ellie is an extinction level event. Ever heard of the, the meteorite Chichilu? Oh boy, I'm really educating you folks today. They think Chichilu is the meteorite that crashed into the Yucatan Peninsula eons ago and killed all the dinosaurs, completely changed Earth. Completely. <coughs> folks are still out there, they're still roaming around. We had a near miss just a few years ago. It was actually within the orbit. I forget the size of it. It was a, it was several metric, uh, several million metric tons and about two or three miles across. It came as close as within the orbit of Mars, or uh, excuse me, Moon, the Moon. It was about 110,000 miles out. Had that hit our Earth, we wouldn't be here today. Things would be different. Things would be a lot different. So, right now, we have absolutely zero way. We, we can detect them. We know they're coming. We got no way to protect ourselves from it. Kind of scary thought, eh? Only way you're going to protect yourself is if you have a robust space program that will allow the Buck Rogers to go out there and either blast that thing to bits or, which is not a great idea, or to move it into a different orbit so it misses you all together. Okay? Extinction level event, survival, okay? And we've already talked about the resources and all that stuff, so uh, I won't go into that again. So that brings me back to my question again, and I'll be closing here real shortly when we get into the fun stuff. So, have I, let me ask you this question. Have I at least got you to thinking about why space exploration is so important? Please say yes. I took a day off from work for this. <laughs> Good. So, do we have a destiny in space? And what's destiny again? When you arrive in a place where you're supposed to be in the future. Okay. Can you believe for a moment that space is our place that we're to arrive at? We're in the cradle here. Carl Sagan said that it's time for us to leave our cradle. 
It's time for us to move out. Granted, we're going to be stuck in the neighborhood for a while, but let's look. Nothing starts unless you make the effort. Old oriental proverb, the, the uh, uh, trip of a million miles starts with one step, right? So we've got to start somewhere. Do we have a destiny in space? If, if what I'm seeing means anything, yes, we do. <coughs> right now, there are 23, give or take, a few, some are more serious than others, 23 commercial companies involved in space flight. That means something to us. Whenever NASA got kicked in the shorts and lost their funding, and everybody thinks we spend so much money on NASA, you know what the, the, the federal budget is for NASA now? Less than one-tenth of one percent. Tiny. Itty bitty. Not much at all. Okay? One-tenth of one percent. So I was really upset whenever the funding was cut and the shuttle program was retired and all that stuff. But it was time for shuttle to go away. It was old technology we needed to do. They were actually stealing parts off of static displays from museums around the country to keep it flying. Did you know that? Because there was nobody building those parts anymore. So it was time for it to go away. But there are 23 <laughs> private companies right now, not the least of which is SpaceX. How about that Elon Musk? Everybody was really upset. They invited him to come to the Inter International Space Development Conference in St. Louis that occurred about a month ago. He didn't come. They were all bummed out. How could he not come? I told him why he didn't come. He didn't need to go. He's already convinced. He's going to Mars, whether anybody else goes with him or not. He's already planning right now. He has been contracted to send some guys around the moon next year, or about two years from now. Private individuals. I don't know where you get that kind of money. I'd like to know, but anyway. So SpaceX, doing phenomenal things. Bigelow Aerospace, Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin, Orbital, ATK, Sierra Nevada, tons of commercial companies. You know what that means to us? Some of you are old enough to remember whenever DVDs first came out, DVD players, what they cost you? $500. Yes, or more. Yes, right? Just a player! Now you can go to Walmart, pick one up for 30 bucks. Blu-ray, right? You know why? Commercialism. They made it. They said the rich people bought the things first, made it profitable for the companies to continue to build and improve and start making these things by the jillions, and before long, you and I can afford it. Same thing's going to happen with space travel. I don't know about the rest of you, but I want to take my week on the space hill, right? I want to do that. And so now we have an opportunity with all these commercial companies, if they can make it profitable, and I believe that they can, if they can make it profitable, we've got a shot at this. So, yes, I believe we can do this. I believe we can live off world. I believe, as, as uh, Kennedy, Kennedy explained in his, in, in his address to the nation, I believe this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out to land a man on the moon and return him safely to earth and then dot 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 and do the other things not because they are easy but because they are hard. No pain, no gain. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, right? So we need to do that. I had the opportunity and I'll leave you with this uh, almost closing thought. Had the, you know who Gene Kranz is? Gene Kranz is the gentleman, he was the flight director that made the saying, failure is not an option, popular, out of Apollo 13. Hate to burst your bubble, but he really didn't say that. It was a movie thing. I'll get into that later. I know who said that. I know how it came about, but he wasn't it. He's always claimed it, but he wasn't it. But anyway, I had an opportunity to interview him, and I said, Gene, how did you pull all this off? You know what he told me? He said, we went out and we hired a bunch of bright, fresh kids out of college that didn't know we couldn't do it. So, do we have a destiny in space? I believe we do. As long as there are dreamers who are willing to look over the next hill 
and put fear aside. We live in such a fear-averse society right now. You're not going to get anywhere if you, if you stay scared all the time. You're just not going to make it. But anyway, put fear aside. Take the word can't out of the dictionary and then make a commitment. Yes, our destiny is in space. Thanks. Have you heard some good stuff? Yeah. Got time? Yeah. yeah. I've actually got some flown items here on the table. Um, mo most, of, most of traveling in space is all about overcoming the harsh environment. I talked about, you know, early on that, that the spacesuits are not comfortable. In order to go outside of the spacecraft, um, the, the EVA suit or extravehicular suit weighs about 350 pounds. Wow. But guess what? Up there, it don't weigh anything, right? However, it is still binding and cumbersome. And so they're working on new ways to get around that. Uh, all of you understand why we have to have a space suit, right? Why? Ooh, not many people get that. No, that's really good. That's really, really good. Um, pressure. Uh, most people get that you got to have air to breathe, right? No air up there, right? Most people don't get that because right here, whether you know it or not, there is 14.7 pounds of pressure on every square inch of your body. You don't notice that because the pressure inside your body is equal to the pressure outside your body, right? Zero's out. The net effect is zero. You start going up the air column and you have that pressure on, it, on you because of the weight of the air above you. All of you stick your right hands out in front of you like this. Do this real fast. You're not stupid. You look. <laughs> what do you feel? You can stop now. Some of you are going to take off. <laughs> what do you feel? Air has mass, weight. So the air column above you has weight, and that, that means that you have this pressure on you. But as you go up in the air column, that weight begins to diminish because there's less air above you until you get up around 60,000 feet. Some nasty things begin to happen. The gases in your blood, we breathe uh, regular oxygen, which is about 20% oxygen and 80% other gases, mostly nitrogen. That nitrogen our body doesn't use, so it's dissolved in our blood as bubbles or as a gas. Well, at that altitude, there's no pressure to keep that dissolved, so it turns back to a gas, back into bubbles, and you develop the bends. And worse than that, your, I mean, your blood literally fizzes up, okay? The gases and the fluids inside your eyeballs will begin to expand and they can pop out of your head. The gases in your, uh, 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 in, uh, your uh, gastric system will begin to expand. Your stomach can explode. And that's all if you haven't frozen to death by that time because that's the other reason we have to have a spacesuit is we have to protect ourselves from the drastic extremes in temperature. On the sun side of spacecraft, uh, there is no atmosphere up there to modify the temperature, so on the sun side, you're well above 250 degrees, you're frying like an egg, and on the shade side, you're about 230 below instantaneous ice cube. That's what I was going to say. That sounds great. That's how I was going to explain it. Go back to, yeah, go back to, go back to pressure. You were doing great with pressure, okay? So we have to have things to protect us. Uh, the, the remarkable thing is that inside a spacesuit, they are so well insulated that literally, the real problem is you get too hot. Your body is a great furnace, and you get too hot, so you have to you have to be cooled down. So they wear these. You can pass these around. Your adults, I assume, you know how to take care of this stuff. I'm not going to tell you that's worth twenty five thousand dollars. <laughs> that's a Russian. That's a Russian EVA garment, extravehicular garment. It's a uh, climate control garment that goes on. Actually, there's several layers to your protection. First. They put on the biomed sensors. Then you put on underwear. And if you're going outside in space, yes, Dor Dorothy, they wear diapers. Yes, they do. Because you can't, there's no one zipping and going behind a tree. So you wear a diaper to absorb that. And then you put on a comfort garment. Then you put this on. Then you put your pressure suit on. Then you put your micrometeoroid suit on. Okay, All of that to survive. So the whole idea is this works just like a radiator. It has water going through there, basically propylene glycol and water uh, and some other witch's brew, and it percolates through there and takes that heat off of your body and vents it out into space so you don't develop heat 
prostration and die. Okay? So you wear all that neat stuff. Then, probably the best way to show this is, oh, and I, I talked about the diapers before. In the Apollo program, it wasn't quite so neat. Any idea what this is? <laughs> yeah, it's a PP collector. It's a, it's a urinal bag. It was worn inside their extravehicular suits. Would you like to see it? I can see it. No. <laughs> <laughs> it has been used. <laughs> Um, and then, <laughs> yes, this was actually from the Skylab program. The ones early on were actually less sophisticated than this. They looked like a Ziploc bag with a, it actually, I hate to say it, it had adhesive on it just like this does. And you'd stick it to your derriere and you'd do your job and then you'd seal it up. And this actually has the black powder is not residue, it's a biocide. They would have to then seal this up and knead that. Oh my land. So it wouldn't spoil because they had to bring it back for analysis. Bill Pogue, who I knew quite well, he was on the third Skylab mission, our first space station. And they were up there for 84 days. And he said whenever they came back from space, they weren't worried about burning up. They were worried about the eight, uh, 384 fecal bags getting loose inside the cabin. Ooh. Okay, so anyway, they need it and bring it home and make fudge out of it. No, I. <laughs> but anyway, so anyway, uh, all that said, so you put on a comfort glove, and then this green, green membrane you see here—that's what actually makes the suit airproof, right? It won't allow, allow the gases to escape. And then you put this over the top of it, which is a restraint layer. Now, any idea what that's all about? Notice it's got laces and buckles and this neat thing here. And, and, and this, this on the end here is to actually protect that inner bladder from abrasion so it doesn't wear through and produce a hole. You've had a really bad day if you get a hole in your suit in space, right? The idea behind the restraint layer, you pass that around too, that's only 18,000. Um, you can, but it, you have to remember, you know, I say that tongue in cheek. Everybody says, oh my gosh. But you have to understand, these don't come off an assembly line. These are custom made. There are seamstresses that put this together and they get paid pretty well, but they pay taxes on this and all this is, is one of us. I mean, it, it's made custom, okay? So it's like a work of art, literally. And so uh, anyway, you put your comfort glove on, that kind of wicks up the perspiration and everything, and then you put this on, and then they, they pull the laces down and everything. And I had the, the opportunity to speak to Linda Godwin. How many of you know about Linda Godwin? Linda Godwin is a Missouri-born astronaut. She was born in Cape Girardeau. She's now teaching at Columbia. And, uh, and I asked her, I said, so what about the spacesuits? And she said, well, they're very uncomfortable, but the worst part literally is the hands. And we were talking about the restraint layer and why you need it. How many of you have seen the movie A Christmas Story? And the kid's got his snowsuit on and he's kind of like this. That's the same thing that would happen to you in your spacesuit because they don't even they don't even inflate it to the 14.7 pounds of regular earthly terrestrial air pressure. They only take it up to about four and a half pounds. That's just enough to keep you from getting the bends and all that nasty stuff. And then that still causes that bladder inside to swell up like a balloon. And if you didn't have some way to restrain that and restrict its inflation then you wouldn't be able to move your fingers and all that neat stuff. Even though they do that, if they don't get the adjustments right, it can bruise the ends of your fingers and it's, it's really bad. Some of the guys on the moon actually had lost fingernails because of it, because they bruised their fingers so bad. So anyway, you put that on and then you put this on over. This is your thermal glove. This protects you from the temperature extremes. It's not sealed. Uh, and if you look really close around the edges here, you can see some foil peeking through. That's your insulation in there. It's layers of reflective foil, right? And, and it's really surprisingly light considering, and then the material out here is a kind of a witch's brew of all kinds of non-flammable materials like uh, Kevlar, Nomex, and beta cloth. Beta cloth is spun glass. And then the palms are made out of a really special material too. Any idea? Feel it. Rubber. Yeah, it's like rubber. Yeah, silicone rubber. 
Okay? Two reasons for that. Number one, silicone rubber is very uh, insensitive to temperature extremes. It won't get hard in the cold. It won't melt in the heat. Uh, but there's another reason for that. Again, when this goes around, and be careful with this. this. I use this for display a lot, and it's starting to show its age. We have some others at the museum that are going to go behind glass and won't be disturbed. But at any rate, um, I, I think it's important you guys get to touch this stuff because it makes a, a visceral contact. I mean, you know, it, it changes. Uh, your whole perception of it changes. But anyway, the reason for the, the stickiness of the rubber, they learned, both the Americans and the Soviets learned real soon how important your fingernails and your fingerprints are for holding small objects. They even tried putting artificial fingernails on the gloves and they kept sticking to their cells. So that wasn't working. So they put this rubber on there to help you have some tactile grip so you could get a hold of what's going on. And then they just designed the tools. This is actually flown in space, by the way. Um, shouldn't be showing this, but like I said, I think it's important. You guys paid for it, so I think it's important you get to see it. Uh, but anyway, this is a, an MMU contingency tool. Not sure exactly what it was for, except for contingencies. But the MMU was the manned maneuvering unit that they used several times in space. And um, uh, again, I don't know what this is for, but basically all this is is a ratchet wrench and an open end wrench with some special design. So what's different on this than a normal wrench? Yeah, yep. Okay, what's that all about? Um, I have no idea. Great. You're pathetic. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe because you've got the big gloves. Yes, yeah, grip. It gives you a better opportunity to get a hold of it, right? Okay. So what about the color? Color significant? Color significant? Huh? Not wire space. Well, it does help to see it, but do you realize that only half of space is black and that's on if you're on the shade side of the earth? The other side is incredibly bright, so that doesn't help you there. But it does do something else. What happens if you go out in the sun on a hot day in a black shirt? You're gonna get hot. If that were painted a dark color on the sun side, it would get so hot they couldn't handle it. Okay? Because there's no atmosphere to mitigate that temperature, the absorption of, of mostly ultraviolet. Okay? You've been really good. I'm either doing a really, really good job here or you're just a really nice guy. That's all I can say. Okay. Yes. To both. Yes. I like to think about as you go out in the summertime, pick up a wrench. It's been late. Yeah, it's just, just, just a chrome wrench, right? Exactly. Now, even in addition to here, I'm sorry. in addition to that, uh, I don't know if you noticed, let me point this out, the black powder around the inside of this, that's not a mistake either. That's your lubricant. What kind of lubricant is that? Graphite. Graphite, exactly, like the stuff in your pencils. You can't use a liquid grease or something like that in the sun side, it boils off. Shade side, it freezes. So they have to use that special. And then the one last thing, the rings. Hold on. Yeah, strap it to you, right? Because in space, in a microgravity environment, I keep saying microgravity because it's not really zero G. There's tons. Everybody says, well, you go to space, there is no gravity. Baloney, there's tons of it. It just depends on where you're at. Uh, and this, when they're in that situation and they're orbiting the Earth, they're not in a zero G situation. It's like going over a big hill in your car and you go over the other side and you drop for a second. Your acceleration toward the ground equals the, the uh, 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 time you're dropping and so there, it zeroes out, the, the gravitation zeroes out. So when you're in space, you're constantly falling. You're just constantly falling around the earth, right? And so that's, so it's not from really zero G, it's microgravity, but anyway. Sorry, I didn't mean for this to turn into a physics lesson. But anyway, um, yes, that you have to, don't look where it go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, so anyway, in this microgravity condition, you have to strap that to you so it doesn't get away, right? Because if it gets this far, even a sixteenth of an inch outside your reach, you ain't getting it. Because if you lunge for it, what's Newton's third law say? Something is put into motion. You're going to go the other way, right? So you can't, I guess you could lunge that way and get to it. You can't swim to it because there's no atmosphere. It's gone. It's gone. 
So that's why they're very, very careful about letting people go outside the spacecraft. If they get loose, they're gone. So they have a little gizmo on the back of their pack. It's called the Safer. It's the Simplified Astronaut um, something extravehicular recovery system. And it's a little jet pack and allows them to get back to the spaceship if they get free. Okay? So then you have all that. So everything, everything form follows function. Any idea what this gizmo is? I'll pass that around to you. Oh, I just love doing this one. You can make it go two different directions. And it's a, it's a jewel. It's a work of art. What is that? Yeah, it looks like no. a stapler to me, too. No. <laughs> <laughs> Ribbit. Wrong end. I'm going to stop guessing. Wrong end. <laughs> it stumbles. Oh, you're getting close. You're getting warm. Oh, like a clamp. Yeah. You're getting really warm. Does that help them to sleep? And... Oh, that's, that's that actually not bad. Nice. That is a foot restraint for the International Space Station. You take this. And you, there are bars all over the station, and you clamp this to the bar, and you put your foot in here, and it holds you in place while you're working inside. And if you decide that you don't want to be in that position, you just do this, and it'll pull that up and go the other way, and it doesn't really make any difference because there is no up or down, right? That's the same reason. Seems these, like this is an awful lot for that. You have to understand you know I mean? the mentality. Like, you have to understand the mentality of engineers. Tell us, Dr. Stone. You can never over-design anything. <laughs> it's engineers. Well, here, here's the deal. And, and you're right. And I understand you're thinking about that. But you have to understand people's lives are at stake here. And so you do not want failures. When we go to the moon, it's better to have built in safety factors on safety factor. When we go to Mars, you can't stop off at the local filling station and get your tires fixed. You're going to have to be able to fix it aboard or make sure that the stuff don't break. Right? So you make it extra strong, extra reliable, so it doesn't break. Okay? But then you go the other end of the spectrum, these are sleep shorts. Okay? Yeah, you notice the Velcro. What's that about? Bingo! There's, it, it serves two functions. If you're eating or something like that, or you're, you're doing something, the other item that you're using has Velcro on it, so you stick it here, and so it doesn't get away from you. Or you can stick yourself to the wall so you don't get away. Right? So there's all types of considerations. Form follows function. The guys from Skylab were telling me that if they lost a, so, a small object inside the habitat, they would wait about two days and go to the air conditioner inlet it would have sucked it to there by then, and they go retrieve their object. Smart idea. Smart idea. Two days. Well, I don't know. My glasses have been misplaced for like a month. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then uh, this is interesting, too. I'll show you this, and then I think I'm done. Uh, this actually is a replica. Unfortunately, it's not the real deal. Uh, that's a geology hammer from the J missions from the Apollo program. It's a high fidelity replica. That's what they used to. Everybody says, well, why didn't they just go out and buy a Stanley? I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, um, geology hammer, big, again, the big handle, so you can get a grip on it. Uh, the other interesting thing that I want, you know, I should have brought a shuttle tile today. I didn't bring it. Whenever the shuttle re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, uh, here, rub your hands together. You've done this in the It gets hot, right? It's the same thing happens. The shuttle is traveling 17,500 miles per hour in order to stay in orbit. It comes crashing back into the atmosphere, and as a result, the friction in the air heats everything up. The space shuttle was built out of aluminum. Okay? Certain surfaces of the space shuttle, when it, it came in for reentry, reached well over 3,000 degrees okay? because of the friction in the air. It's made out of aluminum. Aluminum, depending on the alloy, melts at somewhere between 900 and 11, 12, 1300 degrees, again, depending on the alloy. If you don't have something to protect yourself from that heat, you've had a really bad day. Okay? So this, when you see a picture of the space shuttle, it looks like painted metal. It isn't. It's this. The white on the space shuttle is this. 
And it's here, let me flip it around. Notice on the back, that's RTV silicone. It's all glued on. Same way with the tiles. There were over 30,000 individual cut and fit tiles on the shuttle. This is a material called beta cloth, very highly temperature resistant. And it serves another purpose. Any idea? Not only temperature. And then I'll leave you with this. And by the way, Dr. Som, my mother, God rest her soul, taught me something very early in life. If you can't astound people with brilliance, baffle them with bull. <laughs> but anyway, this, this serves another very important purpose. Cushion, you're onto it. Micrometeoroids and space junk flying around out there. If traveling at the same speed as, as the space shuttle, and if they meet like this, the, the speed the velocity is doubled, so they're worse than a rifle bullet. Even a small grain of sand can penetrate the, the hull of the shuttle or any other spacecraft. So instead of using solid materials, they use material like this. The object hits it, the material gives way, absorbs the energy, doesn't penetrate the shuttle. The space suits are much the same way. Okay. That's it. I went 10 minutes over. I apologize very much. Any questions? Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. So who is, who is our competitor? Which company, or not company, which country is? Well, right now, I mean, right now, if we, get, if we go to the International Space Station, you know how we're getting there? We got a thumb a ride with the Russians, which really sucks. Okay? And it's $50, 50 dollars, 50 dollars, <laughs> yeah, $50 million a ticket. Okay? Uh, the Russians really aren't our competitors. If anyone is, and I don't know that they are either, really, that's China. Uh, if if uh, they're not nearly as advanced as anyone else is, the only reason I would say that they are a competitor is because they have something to prove, right? And very little to lose. So, maybe then. Uh, but I, I really believe this. If we get to Mars, if we really advance into space, it's going to have to be an international effort. But I will admit this. I will admit this. Competition usually makes things happen faster. Much faster. That's why we went to the moon in nine years instead of two decades. Because we were in competition with the Russians. Now, the Russians at the time said they were never in a race with us to go to the moon. Believe that, right? Bugs don't. <laughs> they were. They just happened to blow up their moon rocket. And most of their highest, uh, the most intelligent scientists and engineers they had. Because they were in a hurry. And they didn't take a systematic approach as we did. But there were still lots of near misses. And we... We burned up three very fine astronauts on the launch pad in 1967, the Apollo 1 fire, and we lost Challenger, we lost Columbia. But again, we can't be fear averse if we're going to explore. Gus Gressel said this, and this was a week before he died in the Apollo 1 fire. He said, we hope, and this is a Mullins translation, we hope that if something bad happens, that people will understand that the exploration of space is worth the risk of life. And so, uh, with that said, I conclude, and you guys can go get about your normal routine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.